We are in the middle of a program called Think and Be Productive, and uh, we're in the middle of part two now. Part two is uh, really uh, consists of four principles of production, and those principles are the multitasking myth, and that's what we talked about last month. So we talked about um, how multitasking can be very inefficient and harm you when you're trying to be effective and efficient. Today, we're going to talk about the concept of handcuffing, uh, which is another term for double teaming. Um, handcuffing is really, um, that's the term we've just adopted in our company because we it's good to have a buzzword that we can share. Um, but so we'll be talking about double teaming and the, you know, the importance or the value of, of synergy between people as opposed to independent, you know, working independently and, uh, and how that, uh, how that can be, you know, the pros of, and cons of both of those. And then, and then next month, we'll talk about the five second rule. And that does not have anything to do with uh, food falling on the floor, I promise you. But it's, uh, it's more of a way that uh, we can use for training to help people um, understand their, uh, the expectations of uh, speed versus accuracy and all that. So we're, we'll, we'll dive in here. Uh, this is a little bit of a review, but I do want to talk through this a bit. So some of the problems with productivity, uh, particularly in, in the restaurant industry, we all know that, you know, we've got a lot of things to, to accomplish in the restaurant industry uh, within a certain amount of time. And, and, and some stores, some companies, uh, some people do it more uh, effective and efficient than others. And so um, some of the problems, though, that we see pop up when we have stores or companies or people that aren't as effective um, are, uh, are uh, you know, some of the things we're going to talk about here next. And so the first bullet point here, the average worker in the service industry wastes somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of their time trying to figure out what to do next. That does seem a little bit high, and I've mentioned this a couple times. In the, we talked about this in the last video as well, but um, but that's true, uh, and a lot of that comes with the lack of planning. Um, our first our first set that we did, our first four videos that we did, was more on uh, uh, planning versus productivity. So uh, we did touch base on that, but th that's absolutely true. Uh, we waste more time allowing uh, learned inefficiencies to continue as our default mode of operation. We don't challenge our own ways. So sometimes we do things because that's the way we've always done them. And so we're just kind of on default mode. And maybe it's it's the way that you did it on the last job that you were at. Uh, maybe it's something you learned when you were a kid growing up in your family. Maybe it's something that you read about and you're, you're doing. But, you know, the thing about ideas and um, processes and ideas is, is sometimes they change. You know, when we when we learn better ideas, sometimes they need to replace the old ideas in order to, to, to get better. So it's not always about uh, uh, it's not always about finding the best way and then keeping with it forever. Sometimes it's a, it's an evolving thing. So we need to continually be learning better and more efficient ways of doing things. Um, we settle into inefficient habits that depreciate our efficiency. Uh, inefficient habits are expensive and frustrating to those affected. Um, so for those of you that kind of know the numbers game, you know, when you have uh, a week of sales and operations and you've got, you know, 175 hours on the schedule, um, you, you know, there's varying degrees of efficiency when, when we work. Uh, and, and the more efficient we can be, the more we can save and be profitable within that week, within that store. Now multiply that by 52 weeks in a year and then multiply that by eight stores, you can see that that really can be um, beneficial to um, to learn the most efficient ways to do it because there's a huge opportunity for gain in that. And of course, the more you can be a benefit and add value to the company, the more the company can add value back to you too. So it really all makes a lot of sense. Uh, most leaders in the service industry don't even realize when they are stuck in patterns of inefficiency. They can't see what they can't see. And, and that's that's true. Um, it's and all none of us are immune to that. All of us fall into that category. Um, and it doesn't even matter where you're at in the in the grand scheme of things. You if you've done it for 30 years, you can still fall into this. You can still not know what you don't know. Or if you're a brand new manager, you don't know what you don't know. Everybody on this planet doesn't know what they don't know. So the key is, are we going to focus on what we do know? and keep ourselves stuck in that box only, 
only operating with the things that we already know, or are we going to spend some time outside of the box in our own ignorance, trying to figure out what we don't know? And so that's that's part of the, the, the problem with productivity is oftentimes we just get stuck in something and we settle for less as opposed to strive to become better, uh, strive to learn things that we don't already know, um, maybe strive to push back uh, or, or push through some some things that don't feel natural or that are uncomfortable or learning some skills that we that we don't already have or maybe that don't fall within our our, our best skill set. And so, all right, so let's let's keep moving on here. So today's objective. So we've got a few different objectives uh, objectives here. So first, uh, to give you a tool that will help establish uh, a more intentional and systematic approach towards teamwork and efficiency. So this is one tool that I want to give you today that we're going to talk about. And that's it. This is not a cure-all. It's not going to solve the world's problems, but it's just one tool. Um, but just like somebody's tool belt, if you have this in your tool, you're, you're more equipped to be able to, to tackle uh, different tasks. Um, if, if your tool belt is really limited, you know, if all you've got is a hammer and that's all you have, you know, you're not going to do well with screws and you're not going to do well with, you know, other things that require more finesse than a hammer. And so um, this is one tool. Second objective, you'll need to be willing to challenge uh, traditional ideas about dividing and conquering that you may hold. So it's pretty natural, especially in the restaurant industry, to naturally go to a place of dividing and conquering. And we're going to we're gonna talk about that a little bit today, more today. Some of you have already heard it a number of times, and uh, it's not a matter of hearing it. It's more of an, a, a matter of understanding it or embracing it. And then the third objective here is sometimes we need to let go of seemingly good ideas to make room for better ones. So my challenge to you all here today is uh, rather than kind of do that whole, oh, I don't know, Joel, I've been dividing and conquering for years. It seems to work pretty well for me. I want to challenge you to take this to another level uh, because I promise you um, there is another level. That that other level is that place of ignorance that I was talking about, right? It's you don't know what you don't know. Well, there is something more that you can know. You just got to go out into the darkness, the places that you've never been and, and find it. So, all right, that's my challenge to y'all. Here we go. So rule number two, handcuffing or double teaming. Um, before I go through this slide here, I want to I want to mention that when I talk about handcuffing or double teaming, what I'm not assuming is that is that this is a catch-all for everything. Like I mentioned with the with the tool belt, it's one tool in in your repertoire that, when used appropriately, will always be the most effective. I'm not suggesting that there is a that there's not a time when divide and conquer is the best route because there is. There's always going to be a time where dividing and conquering is, is the best way to do this. But I really want to focus today on, on the times or the circumstances when handcuffing is the best way to do this. And it's really, it, it's, it's really important that you understand the difference so you can discern, so you can know when it's appropriate to handcuff and when it's appropriate to divide and conquer. Because if you get it wrong, it's not going to be very efficient. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So let's say you move for, or you, uh, you work for a moving company, okay? So you go into pieces ha people's house and you pack things up and you move things onto a truck, okay? Pretty self-explanatory with that. So uh, there would be items that you would move that would only require one person, okay? And it would be very inefficient for you to double team on. Like if you're gonna move a, a, a potted plant or a, a box that weighs 15 pounds, okay? It, it doesn't make sense to go into somebody's house and start picking up all of the light things and double teaming on it because it would be a waste of time. Um, anything that's a task that's simple um, usually can be done by one person. So if you can grab one box and the other person can grab another box and they're both within, you know, within your, your load capacity, then it's better to, to, to divide and conquer and get things done. You can move twice as fast if you do it that way. If you, if you divide and conquer and grab the easier things and move. If you're double teaming on all the light and easy stuff, it's just gonna take twice as long. Okay, now on the contrary though, if, if you've got some heavy items, some things that uh, are just beyond your capacity, 
uh, maybe 20, 30% beyond your capacity to, to lift on your own, then you could struggle with it. You could take this recliner and you could struggle trying to get it up the steps and out the door. And maybe it'll take you a half an hour to get this done when it would just take five or five minutes to, to double team on it, to get another set of hands to help you lift it and, and to pull it up the steps and to, to take it where it needs to be. So on the bigger tasks, um, it's always more efficient to double team, okay? And on the littler tasks, it's it's more efficient to divide and conquer, all right? Hopefully that all makes sense. So let's let's jump into this and talk about what double teaming is and how we're gonna apply it. So in this context, double teaming on tasks that take more than 15 minutes, such as sheeting, chopping dough, shredding cheese, and premix, okay? Those are tasks that take more than 15 minutes. Now, they're not necessarily difficult tasks, like you know, lifting you know a heavy object in the example that I use, but they're tasks that take a lot more time to do uh, by yourself than it does with with two people. Okay, so that's these are the kind of tasks we're talking about. Uh, so we're going to talk about how to avoid the divide and conquer urge on these you know bigger tasks. Uh, divide and conquer is another form of multitasking, but applied to multiple people. So if you were on our um, on our call last. Uh, month, we really talked about multitasking. Okay. And that's trying to do two different things at the same time when you should be focusing on one. Right. And, uh, and this is kind of the same thing. It's the same thing, but only this is with multiple people. So when we, when we double team, we're focusing on one thing and getting it done with two people or more people, maybe it's a team, whatever it is. Um, and, and knocking that out uh, because it's more efficient, uh, to do it together instead of individually. All right. Um, this is a general statement. It's not a scientific uh, formula, but um, basically in the restaurant industry for many of the bigger tasks, what one person can do in two hours, two can do in 45 minutes together. Okay. And I've actually done the timing on this. I, I remember studying this. I had a theory on this and I wanted to find out how much it was true. And the results basically have helped me to understand this a lot better. And this goes back several years, but I actually... Um, timed one person doing two hours of sheeting, right? So it took them two hours to sheet, you know, however many totes of, of dough it was. And I watched them do that. The next day I suggested we make a change and I, I teamed somebody else up with them. And the person that I put with them was a little slower than they were. And they got it done in 45 minutes. So we teamed up a person that wasn't quite as, as fast as the individual and they got it done in less than half the time. And so it just shows that that you can save time by double teaming. And we're going to get into that a lot more detailed here in a few minutes, but you'll, you'll get it by the time we're done. And then and then uh, last month we talked about pillaging as as individuals, how we how we want to um, chew through one thing and and from start to finish and complete it and clean up uh, and put things away and get things in order. Um, uh, before you move on to the next task. And that, that really that really works the same way with a team as well or with multiple people. We wanna attack a single uh, larger task uh, aggressively and using time goals and benchmarking, but then you know finish it to completion before moving on to the next task. Part of that is because there's a, there's a, natural, um, there's a natural falling off of efficiency when we let any task last, last longer than it needs to. There's just there's a trailing off of efficiency in that. And we'll we'll get to that in a minute. So. Um, all right. So let's talk about efficiency lost depreciation of efficiency. When one person works independently for an extended amount of time on the same task, efficiency trails off significantly. OK, and here's an example. OK, the example is uh, sheeting dough for two hours alone. OK. The first couple of totes are going to be much faster than the last few totes. Okay, so if you're going to if if you're going to sheet a dozen totes of some kind of dough, whatever it is, the first three or four totes that you sheet are always going to be faster than the last three or four totes that you sheet because there's a natural falling off. Okay, by by nature we all get bored, we all lose our steam, and we we just become less effective. Uh, over time. It's just, you know, nobody's, nobody's immune to this. This is just the way we are. And so there's, uh, there's an advantage to 
working hard, chewing through something, moving on to the next thing, chew through it, moving on. But when we get stuck in doing the same thing for extended amount of times, we, we really have a, a lack of, of uh, efficiency. And I'm sure that some of you are, can relate to that. You're like, yeah, I know I hate cheating dough for two hours. I hate that. And it's at the end, I'm just dragging. And so if you've worked in this business long enough, uh, you know that to be true. Even if you're, it's not Papa Murphy's, anything in the restaurant industry or the retail industry, it just gets old. Uh, second part here is uh, we lack challenge. So when working by yourself unchallenged, you feel the freedom to work at your normal speed. Okay. And that's true. It's kind of a lack of accountability, but it's really easy to work at your normal speed when there's no external influence that's, that's challenging you to work faster than that. So, um, you know, so we look at uh, maybe the sheeting, you know, the sheeting or any of these tasks that we're talking about. Maybe it's pre-makes, maybe it's chopping dough, sheeting dough, maybe it's shredding cheese, whatever it is. So the whole idea here is that is that when when we uh, when we do this by ourselves, we're just gonna we're, we're gonna do this at normal speed, and and it's really difficult to figure out how to do it at a faster speed than normal speed if there's no input, there's no stimulus that that causes you to do that. OK, and then and then we lack accountability. So when we're working in isolation, our actions are unnoticed and we cut corners. OK, quality and productivity levels depreciate. We do just enough to get by when when we're working by ourselves. We you know, we're lacking accountability there and we can take shortcuts. You are a whole lot less likely to take shortcuts or to settle for maybe a less um, a lesser quality product or or just work at your fastest speed when you're by yourself. It's just, it's just the truth. It's the way it is. And so oftentimes we'll do just enough when nobody's looking. Okay. We're more likely to do as much as we can when people are looking, but just enough when they're not looking. All right. So those are kind of the ideas that lead to um, efficiency lost uh, when it comes to production. So let's shift gears here and we're going to talk about efficiency gained. Okay. So, how do we gain efficiency um, through, particularly through double teaming or handcuffing? So number one is that when you're working um, together with another person and you're handcuffing, and you're double teaming, whether that be sheeting, chopping dough, sauce and cheeses, pre-makes, whatever that is, um, the, the larger tasks, whenever you're doing that, there's always going to be one person typically that are going to be faster than the other person. Okay. And we're going to call that person the pace setter. And it, it, may be, it may be the manager, the general manager, or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's the assistant manager that's faster than the general manager. Maybe it's like a, a shift leader. Or maybe it's a, a red shirt that's just faster than everybody else. But there's always going to be one person that's a little bit faster. Um, now, sometimes if you get two veterans working next to each other, maybe it's very hard to distinguish, uh, you know, who the most effective person is. I mean, I don't know, you know, if I put, you know, Rose and Misty in the same room and, have them do that. I don't know. I don't know who'd be faster and I don't care because I know it would be pretty, pretty fast. But either way, there's always going to be a pace setter. There's always going to be one person that's pushing the other person to go a little bit faster. Um, and maybe it's because they, they want to a little bit more. They just have more of a drive or maybe it's because of the experience. They just have a better hand-eye coordination that's been developed over time. Either way, always going to be one person that's faster. And that means um, if there's going to be a pace setter, there's always going to be a chaser. One person always going to be trying to keep up with the pace setter. So either way, though, this is going to promote um, better efficiency on both parts because the pace setter, well, the pace setter wants to stay ahead because they want to show the other person how fast they can do this. Not only that, but they may have other reasons, too, for the person becoming as efficient as they can. Maybe it's the manager and they want their people to be as efficient as they can. And they're they're a pace setter because they're setting the example. And so that certainly is. But the chaser also is is incentivized. You know, if you're a, a newer person, you're training, you're going to want to try to keep up with that pace setter because you want to show that, hey, I can do this. I can, you know, uh, it, it's going to push me. I'm going to sweat, but I'm going to keep up. I'm going to do everything I can to keep up with this pace setter so that, you know, pace setter at the end of the shift says, man, you did a good job. Good job keeping up. But it's going to take work. And the, the truth is, is that when you have a pace setter and a chaser, neither one are typically going to work at their normal speed. They're, they're always going to push themselves to be faster than normal because it's it's naturally, uh, they're, they're naturally incentivized to do that just simply because they're working with somebody else and they want to show themselves to be competent. 
Okay, hopefully that makes sense. This is that's a huge, huge thing. And if you get this, you understand that you'll embrace it and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And so I challenge you when you're double teaming, pay attention, especially if you're not one of the people. If you're the third party, and you're watching two people, two other people double team, pay attention. You'll see what I'm talking about. All right. Handcuffing promotes uh, teamwork and interdependence. OK, someone is always stretched and it's usually everybody. It's kind of related to the pace setter and, and chaser, but it's it's also not just in the, independently trying to impress the other person, like with the pace setter and the chaser. It's also that when you work next to each other and you and you're 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 working together, you you figure out ways to help. Um, to help the synergy. Maybe you're making pizzas up front and there's, there's things you can do to kind of bump and slide and to adjust and to help each other. And you just kind of figure out that, that teamwork part. And so there's always some synergy that happens when two people are working together. They figure out the best way to work with each, with each other and they just kind of gel. So that's, uh, that's pretty common too. And then uh, when we hold each other accountable for quality and accuracy, we make less mistakes and avoid wasting product and time doing tasks over. So again, going back to that working independently, if you're working independently by yourself and there's less accountability, you're more likely to take shortcuts and or maybe not pay attention quite as much if somebody isn't there um, being I don't know, you know, part of the system with you. And so we make more mistakes. Two people together will always be more accurate because they're watching over each other's shoulder. Um, and if, if they're, uh, if they're looking at each other's jobs and, 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 uh, and, uh, helping each other get better and challenging each other, then it's always going to be better. No doubt. There's a, you know, there's an ancient proverb that says, um, that says, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Okay. So there really is a, a sharpening effect when two people work together. All right. Hopefully that all makes sense. So that's that's the efficiency gained uh, with double teaming. Hopefully that all makes sense to you. And then, so here's what the process looks like, just for a little bit of a visual here. So the process is that you got person number one and you got person number two, and they really just double team on the task. So you got task number one, and they just they decide this. They decide, okay, you and I are going to do this together. Then they attack it. They're working together. Then they complete it. Okay, and you complete the task. Then you move into the the cleanup mode. You you clean up and then you move on to the next task. Okay, then you do you repeat the same thing. The person one and person two work together on task number two, attack, complete, clean up and move on. Now, if you get through all of the bigger tasks, maybe you've got all of your, uh, your add-on sales done and you've got your sheeting done and you've chopped your dough and, and you got some pre-makes done and your cheese is shredded and now it's on to, you know, chopping some tomatoes and prepping some spinach and uh, doing up some sauces. Okay, well, in those cases, um, you can divide and conquer a bit on those. Those are simpler tasks that don't necessarily take two people. And I'm not sure that two people can make it a lot more effective. Now, sometimes I think cutting tomatoes can. You can have one person chopping them and one person, uh, you know, or one person cut, cutting them and one person chopping them. But, you know, some of the, some of the tasks, there's just very little to gain by, by uh, double teaming. So you need, just need to be smart about that and, and, and uh, be discerning. And so, but once you're done with the double teaming, the bigger tasks, then you can go into the, into the dividing and conquering of the smaller things and, um, and, and we'll kind of knock those out as we go. So, so I'm going to go ahead and open it up for some more discussion with you guys. And uh, we can talk about this. I would love to have some of you veterans that are on the call uh, kind of share on this as well and give some examples of what you've experienced and, and so on. But uh all right, I got one. So we handcuff when we sheet go and stuff like that. Of course, you know, I try to wrap. Um, but since I'm pretty quick at wrapping to Misty's sheeting, I can pretty much wrap one on one with her sheeting. Um, so sometimes like we handcuff for that, but sometimes I will detach briefly and go like catch up all the dough totes and the dishes and stuff like that while she starts a pile for me to kind of go back and handcuff again and catch back up on because if, I mean, if you're quick enough, you can catch up pretty easy, but we try to do like handcuff and then detach a little bit to kind of keep up on some of our other things, maybe. Yep. Um, we well, kind of found that works for us. And keeping up on the dough toe too, that's really part of sheeting. So it kind of makes sense, but you can bump and slide yeah. a little bit too. Maybe while you're catching up on the dough toes, if she gets ahead a little bit on some of the Cross, she can just slide yeah. over and wrap a few of those <laughs> so that you don't have as big of a pile when you get back from doing the dishes. So or, there's ways to bump and slide. 
yeah, or she'll take that time, like, if she knows I've got a pile going and she's ready for emptying her next tote, she'll start pounding dough balls. Yeah. And then I can come back and wrap, and we kind of we kind of have that going back and forth where we try to keep all of that stuff contained in the same time frame kind of way. Yep. That's yeah. That, those are those are great examples, and that's where that synergy comes in, especially if you've worked with each other long enough as you have. You just there's yeah. just things that you just know. You just you just know mm -hmm. you know what that person's next move is going to be because you've done it. You know. 12 dozen times already. And so, you know, yeah. we, we closed, we closed, we worked and opened to close uh, a Friday, one Friday because nobody else could work and we were fort staffed and COVID and all that crap. And it was her and I all day long. And we were, I mean, we were busy. It was like super busy, but, but it we didn't were, feel like it was, didn't feel like we were busy at all because we knew what the other one was thinking, what was going to be next. And, you know, it was just that kind of flow, you know, what's, what's happening next, you know, what they're going to do next and what to expect, you know, yep. it's just, <clears throat> yep. you know, just don't stand there and watch somebody, you know, on the line, a sausage, cheese, and pizza, you know what it is, start pulling the ingredients for it so they can start, you can start getting it on there right as soon as they're done, you know, getting cheese on them. And stuff. Yeah, your handcuffs can have varying lengths, you know, she can be a sauce and cheese and I can be down at the topping cheese, yep. getting some stuff ready or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep, that's right. Yeah, these are all great examples. And you know, it's interesting too. Like, uh, you know, I mentioned there's always gonna be a pace setter and there's always gonna be a chaser. But in the event that, you know, kind of like in this scenario with both of you guys are probably as fast as you're going to get, um, the, you know, maybe there's not a chaser and a pace setter, but it doesn't matter because you're still pushing each other, right? Because neither one of you yeah, care who's one. faster anymore. You just know that you got to get something done and so you're both going to work as fast as you can, right? I can always get faster. <laughs> you can always get faster. <laughs> yeah, that no, that's true. Good point. I think you can get more efficient, you know, by thinking through things. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a good point. Um, but you know, the greatest way, like if you've worked for as long as you guys have, the greatest ways for you to affect the store isn't getting faster at sheeting because you guys aren't, you know, that's not where you have the most to gain. But uh, uh, there's other things and more. But just, uh, you know, but those those are great thoughts. Those are great, great points on that. And, and you know, I've seen plenty of times where I've walked into a store and I've watched two people in the store and they're just dividing and conquering, doing things independently. And there just is no synergy. They're not mm -hmm. bumping and sliding. They're not. They're just kind of both working at their normal speed, not being challenged. One person's sheeting dough for two hours. The other person's doing chopping. I've seen people chop dough one person chopping dough or run, you know, and then the other person sheeting dough at the same time. It's like, Oh man, this is so inefficient. And if you measure mm -hmm. it at the end of the end of the day, you can see these are the people that are really struggling getting things done. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you can't work as a good team together and work efficiency and uh, filling each other's gaps that way, you're really going to struggle. And I've just really never seen anybody that embraces the divide and conquer uh, with the bigger task. I've never really seen anybody that just gets really efficient at that. And, and even if they are relatively efficient, maybe more efficient than other people that don't do that, that doesn't mean that they're as efficient as they would be if they did embrace, you know, better, um, uh, better ways of doing it. So. Yeah. Um, I have had that similar situation on the line. Um, Usually, sometimes on the pizza station, you know, we make and we got six or eight pizzas cooking, um, and another person is constantly making pizzas. And we actually used to toss dough by hand. Um, so usually, uh, I will come through and make sure that they have enough cheese, make sure they have enough sausage, and then just keep everything going just so they don't run out of product. Yep. Yep. And it, there, it requires an awareness and not just kind of getting your face stuck in the cheese where you're just focusing on what your hands are touching, but this awareness of like, what's other people doing at the same time and how can you work together to make things smooth and work? And that's, that's something that really does take that extra awareness, right? right. Yep. All right. Yeah. Good thoughts. Excellent. Anybody else? How about you, Stacy? You and Logan, you guys experienced some of this? They might be cleaning up. All right. Who wants to talk about this as a challenge? 
Like for instance, how, who's, who's willing to say, Hey, I, you know, I do struggle with this and this is not easy because I, I am stuck in, in a different pattern of thinking and, and I, I need to work out of this. Anybody in that situation that'd be uh, kind of have the guts to admit that. Uh, I'm, I'm like that. Okay. There's no shame. I, we won't shame you, Nicole. I promise. <laughs> I need to work on my uh, handcuffing skills. Definitely. Uh, we tend to divide and conquer here. So that's something we're trying to fix because I know it takes us a while to get some of our stuff done if we don't do it together. So yeah. Yeah. Definitely something we need to work on in this course. Yep. Good. And so keep in mind that the process, here's what the process looks like in order for this to be embraced by somebody. So the, the first step of this process is that, um, you know, you have to hear it. You actually have to hear somebody say, uh, maybe you should try handcuffing instead of dividing and conquering. Because if no one says it to you, no out, outside influence comes in and actually brings that idea to your attention, you may just keep doing what you've always done. Maybe you're always you know, um, dividing and conquering. So the first thing that you need is somebody to bring that to your attention. So you need to hear it. The second thing that you need to do is you need to understand it because hearing isn't enough. If you just hear something, that doesn't mean you understand it. It doesn't mean you're going to, you know, do it just because you hear it. We hear all kinds of ideas that we just put off and don't really take seriously all the time. So the second step then is you've got to, you've, you've got to, you've got to understand it. So you need to listen and hear the logic behind it. And then, when it makes sense to you, then that will drive you to take the next step. And the next step is to experience it. See, so you need to hear it. Then you need to, then you need to understand it. And if you don't understand it, you're not going to experience it. You're not going to actually try it. And then once you try it and you see, you say, okay, you know what? Joel's got this harebrained idea. I don't know. It's this handcuffing thing, but um, I think I kind of understand it, but uh, let's try it. Okay. So if you do that, you're probably not really going to try it. But if you, if you learn it and, and understand it, then you're going to say, oh, no, we got to try this. Let's do this because I, I, I need to get better. I need to get faster. So let's do this. And, and then you, you get into it and you commit to it. And then the synergy starts to happen. Then you become a believer in it. You realize, wow, okay, I have more time at the end of, you know, of my prep than I did before. And then the proof is in the pudding. And then so, so you, need to, you need to hear it. Um, then you need to understand it. Then you need to experience it before you can teach it. Okay. Once you've experienced it, then you can teach it. See, you can't teach it if you've only heard it. If you've, if you've never heard it and then understood it. Okay. If you, if you don't understand it, you can't teach it because no one will know what you're talking about because you, you don't, you can't explain it well enough because you don't even understand it yourself. But you hear it, you understand it, you experience it, then you can teach it. And when you teach it in that, if you do it in that order, and then you teach it, you'll teach it with, with confidence and you'll teach it with authority. And I don't mean authority like a boss. I just mean as, as a person that knows what they're talking about with, without certainty. If I'm going to teach you guys this and I'm in the, in the back of the room with you if, and you're new, I'm going to teach this in a way that's going to leave you no doubt because I already know it works. I'm not going to be skeptical about it. I'm not going, well, I think it's going to work. It's trying. No, I'm talking about 30 years of doing this. You know, and so, and if you were to work in, in the stores of some of our senior, you know, our senior managers, you're going to see the same thing. It's like, well, they're not guessing. They've done this. They've done this for a long time. There's no, there's no, there's no guessing. So in order to teach it, you got to, you got to know all those things. And then once you teach it, then it becomes the norm in your store. Okay. So there's those steps that's in, in between. So I would challenge you to think through those steps. Where are you getting hung up on the step? Is it number one, no one's told you maybe prior to this, um, presentation no one's told you but now now you've been told so now the next step is to is just to fully understand it and to learn it in more detail of how it works okay and so maybe the training has helped a little bit with that maybe uh, ongoing training with um with other other people to help you the senior leaders can help you kind of learn that a little bit more and then to step in that next thing where you're you're experiencing and just doing it so all right hey i think we're going to call this a wrap and i appreciate your guys participation hopefully this is helpful